congregation, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. It can be found on page 1210 in your pew Bibles. We'll be reading the first three verses of 1 Corinthians this evening. And as we examine these verses, we'll also take a look at Belgic Confession, Article 27, which can be found on pages 82 and 83 in your Psalter hymnals. So 1 Corinthians 1 through 3 and Article 27 of the Belgic Confession. But before we proceed, let's go before our God in prayer. O Lord, our God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we come to your word once again this evening, we pray that you would give us fresh eyes. We pray that you would pour out the Holy Spirit upon us, that we might be blessed by the Spirit of truth. Please let us see what you would have us see. Let us hear what you would have us hear. Teach our hearts, Lord. Align our wills with your will and bless us with your word that we may all sing together with the joy of true holiness. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 3. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And turning to the Belgic Confession, Article 27, we read this. We believe and profess one Catholic or universal church which is a holy congregation of true Christian believers, all expecting their salvation in Jesus Christ, being washed by his blood, sanctified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. This church has been from the beginning of the world and will be to the end thereof, which is evident from this, that Christ is an eternal king, which without subjects he cannot be. And this holy church is preserved or supported by God against the rage of the whole world, though it sometimes for a while appears very small, and in the eyes of men to be reduced to nothing, as during the perilous reign of Ahab the Lord reserved unto him 7,000 men who had not bowed their knees to Baal. Furthermore, this holy church is not confined, bound, or limited to a certain place or to certain persons, but is spread and dispersed over the whole world, and yet is joined and united with heart and will by the power of faith, in one and the same spirit. Now, I invite you to keep both your Bible and your Psalter hymnals open, as we'll be referring to both throughout the course of the sermon. And as we begin, we need to understand that these first three verses of 1 Corinthians are the introduction to the letter. Most letters of antiquity began that way, stating first who was sending the letter, then who was supposed to be receiving the letter, and then some form of greetings. Pericles of Rome to Odysseus of Antioch, greetings. That's basically the gist of what's going on. And so as we come to these greetings in the New Testament epistles, we often tend to skip over them. Well, Paul's just saying hello. Right, let's move past the stuff that we would put on our envelopes, and let's get to the letter itself. Let's get to the good stuff, to that doctrine that he's going to bring forth later in the letter. But by skipping over these greetings, we're actually missing a lot of important things. Because in these introductions, Paul is often setting forth the themes for his letters. He knows what he's going to say later on, and now he's laying the groundwork for the message already in his greetings. And this greeting of 1 Corinthians is no different. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul is addressing a church that was divided along many different issues. He was speaking to a church that had many different factions, one that was dividing itself because of a number of things. And so to this church, to the Corinthian church, Paul wanted to promote the unity of the church of God. And with that goal in mind, in these three verses, we see our theme. Because the church of God is united in Christ, we must seek unity. 
Because the church of God is united in Christ, we must seek unity. And we see that the church must seek unity despite three things. Despite our sinfulness, despite our background, and despite our geography. Those will be our three, our three points this evening. And first, we see that the church of God is united in Christ despite our sinfulness. Because the church is made up of sinners. It's made up of broken people who need Jesus. And that's very clear from looking at the church of God that is in Corinth, to whom Paul is writing. The Corinthian church struggled with a lot of sin. And the biggest sin on the docket was sexual immorality. We see that in chapter 5 of this letter. In that chapter, Paul addresses a major sin that's found its way into the Corinthian church. A man has his father's wife. There's sexual immorality going on in this church. And so it's very clear that this church is dealing with sin. Unfortunately, they've been tolerating this sin. They've even been boasting about it. They have this sin in their midst and they are united in their acceptance of it. They are united, but they are united because of their sinfulness and not despite it. But that's not how the church is supposed to behave. The church is not supposed to unite around a sin, but rather despite the sin that still clings to them. We see this in our day too as churches unite together in their acceptance of same-sex marriage, as they tolerate, as they even celebrate the sin that's in their midst. But uniting around sin, whether that's the sexual immorality of the Corinthians or whether that's sexual immorality today or whether that's around another sin entirely, that concept of uniting around sin should be entirely foreign in the church of God. Because we don't unite around sin, we don't find our identity in our sin. No, we are united in Christ. We find our identity in Christ. Now, to be sure, we are all sinful people. We may, in fact, struggle with same-sex attraction. We may struggle with a host of other sins, with lust, with greed, with gluttony, with pride. We suffer from a host of sins. We all struggle with sin. But we are united not because of our sin, but in spite of it. We are united because we are all sinful people who need Jesus who have been called by Jesus out of our sin and in to holiness. And that's how Paul describes the church to whom he's writing, as we see in verse 2, where he says this, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now these people are sinners, yes, but that's not how Paul describes them. He describes the church as those who are sanctified in Christ. And that's an important term for understanding the church. When we come to faith in Christ, we are justified, right? We are counted righteous by God, where the righteousness of Jesus is credited to our account. But our justification happens once, at that point in which we believe. And from then on, throughout the rest of our lives, the process of sanctification happens. And that process is the walk of the Christian life, of becoming more and more like Christ every day, of taking off our sinful self and putting on the new self. We're being sanctified throughout our lives. And we can learn two things about our sanctification by that Greek word that's used there, hagiazo, for sanctify. And first, this word is in the passive voice. Those sanctified are that way because something outside of them is working on them to make them that way. They're passive in it. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, in their hearts, working them, working in them, sanctifying them. We don't sanctify ourselves. We don't do that work on our own. It's the Holy Spirit working through us. And second, this word sanctified is in the perfect tense. And that tense in the Greek language indicates action that happened in the past with an effect to the present. It did happen, and it's still happening. And so we can see that this sanctification is a process. It has happened in the, life, in the lives of believers, and it is happening in the lives of believers. They are being sanctified. It's a process. And this is how Paul chooses to address the Corinthian church. 
He doesn't address them by identifying them with their sin. He addresses them as those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus and who are being made more and more like him by the Holy Spirit. And we see this truth laid out in the first article, or the first paragraph of Article 27 of the Belgic Confession, which we read earlier. The church is a holy congregation of true Christian believers, all expecting their salvation in Jesus Christ, being washed by his blood, sanctified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, this document, the Belgic Confession, it draws out the truths of the Bible. It it doesn't make things up on its own. Rather, it seeks to outline what the Bible says, and it does that here. It says that the church is full of sinners who have come to Christ, who are justified, who have been justified, and are being sanctified. The church is full of those who are united to Christ in faith and are being shaped more and more into his likeness. However, we need to remember that we are still in that process. We're not done being sanctified. We're not completely free of sin yet, and so the church of God, the Corinthian church back then, and us here this evening, we need to recognize that we must seek unity despite our sinfulness. Look around you for a moment. Look around at all these people here that are a part of the church with you. Young people, older people, men, women, people you like, and maybe some that get on your nerves sometimes. However, nobody that you see around you tonight is perfect. They're all in that sanctification process. And because of that, they're all going to mess up at one point or another. And when that happens, you need to make a choice. Are you going to forgive them? Are you going to hold it against them? Are you going to be patient with them? Or are you going to pull a Mount St. Helens and just erupt all over the place? Now, this doesn't mean that we are to excuse sin. We can't be like the Corinthian church and try to find unity in our sin and try to be okay with that. That's not what Paul does. And that's not what we should do. Rather, in those moments when we're faced with a fellow believer's sin, when it affects our lives in such a way that we can't ignore it, We need to remember that we are in a group of sinners who are following Jesus. And we're all a part of this church. We're all traveling in this life together, fixing our eyes on Jesus as we go. And so we need to be patient with each other. We need to be understanding with each other. We need to be considerate to our brothers and sisters in the church. Because we are united in Christ, The church of God must seek unity despite our sinfulness. And we also need to seek unity despite our backgrounds. And this is our second point this evening, that the church of God must seek unity despite our backgrounds. Now, the Corinthian church to whom Paul is writing consisted of people from all types of backgrounds. Corinth was a Roman city in the midst of the old Greek empire, And it was an important stop on major trade routes. And like most stops on a trade routes, there were all kinds of people coming in and settling. There were Roman citizens, there were slaves, there were a huge variety of people who settled there. There were all kinds of people along the social spectrum. And in that society, where you were on that spectrum played an important role in your life. Status, your your place in society uh, was influenced by many different factors. How much money you had, how much education you had, what family you came from, what you did for business. All of these factors played a role in your placement on that social spectrum. And so Corinthian society was one of, it was a big scramble to the top, clawing and scratching your way to the top and flaunting your status in front of everybody. And this focus on status had crept into the church. If you look down uh, in your Bibles to verses 10 and seven, 10 through 17 of chapter 1, you see that Paul talks about divisions that were present in the Corinthian church, of quarrels that had sprung up. People were saying, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. I follow Christ. 
And these declarations were their way of asserting their position over their fellow church members. Well, I heard Paul preach the gospel, so I'm better than you. You only heard Apollos. Right? There was division in the church because of the struggle for status. But Paul puts a stop to that kind of thinking in these very first few verses of his letter. In this greeting to the Corinthian church, you'll notice that he doesn't single anybody out. He doesn't address the leaders of the congregation or those deemed most important by societal standards. In verse 2, he greets the church of God, the unified body of believers that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together. Right? They're all lumped together. No one is elevated above anybody else. Paul is stressing the unity that the church is supposed to have despite their different backgrounds. And he does that in verse 1, too. Look at that verse with me. Verse 1, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. And that's such an interesting way to describe himself. He doesn't say, Paul, the founder of the Corinthian church. Now, he could have. As we see in Acts 18, that Paul was the one who went to Corinth. He preached the gospel, and many people believed because of his preaching. But he didn't promote himself as a great leader or try to draw attention to his own honor. Nope. He's just Paul, who was called by the will of God to be an apostle. He's passive in that role. God's the one who called him, and now he's just serving Jesus. And his humility shows the Corinthian church that God is the one who deserves all the honor, not him. Because Paul, Paul's background was nothing for him to boast of either, was it? Right? He was an early persecutor of the church. He gave approval at the stoning of Stephen, and he imprisoned followers of the way. He didn't deserve to be a part of this church, and yet God called him to be his servant. And so Paul continually draws the attention away from himself. He puts it back on God. And he also draws the attention away from himself uh, by referring to someone else in his greeting. Verse 1 again, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Now be honest. You don't need to raise your hands, but how many of you, before we read it this evening, knew the name Sosthenes was in the Bible. It's not a very familiar name, is it? Kids, you've, never, you've probably never heard of Sosthenes in Sunday school, right? You've got Moses and the burning bush. You've got Daniel in the lion's den and Sosthenes? It's, it's unfamiliar. He's an unfamiliar guy. Now, the Corinthian church probably knew him, but we really don't. He might be the same Sosthenes that's mentioned in Acts 18, who was the ruler of the synagogue in Corinth, but he might not be. We're not too sure who this guy Sosthenes was, but we do know that he's not on the same level as Paul, right? On the one hand, you've got the Apostle Paul, the, the great missionary of the church who spread the gospel wherever he went, one of the best-known Christians in all of history, and on the other hand, you've got Sosthenes, a name that's basically been lost to history from us. And so by putting Sosthenes in the greeting with himself, Paul is demonstrating to the Corinthian church the importance of unity, despite whatever background a person has come from. That the important can be mentioned with the unimportant is proof that the church of God is to place a high priority on unity and ignore that battle for status that the world finds so important. Because in fact, the Corinthian church wasn't that unique in and of themselves. They weren't the first church, right? They weren't the be-all and end-all of God's church. They were just members of one local expression of the church of God, the church which has always existed, according to the second paragraph of Article 27. This church has been from the beginning of the world, and will be to the end thereof. It's always existed. The church has always existed in this world, and we see that through the history of the Bible, don't we? It began with a family, with Adam and Eve. 
It expanded to a clan of people with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their children. It expanded farther to the nation of Israel. And then with the Great Commission and people like Paul spreading the gospel to places like Corinth, the church continued to grow. And so the Corinthian church was simply joining the ranks of followers of Jesus. They were just a part of God's church, and so therefore their backgrounds didn't really matter. They could be united in Jesus despite their backgrounds. They didn't have to focus on their social status or their popularity, but they could be humbly united to each other through Jesus. Every one of us here this evening has a different background. Some of you have been in the church for years, maybe decades. Maybe some of you are new to the church. Some of you make a lot of money. Others of you struggle to make it through each month. Some of you are seen as pillars of the church. Some of you keep to the edges or fade into the background. And yet, you are all a part of this church. You are all part of, the local ex- of this local expression of the church of God, and therefore, as you deal with each other, as you interact with each other, you must seek unity with each other. Because we are all in this together, no matter what position we have outside of church, no matter what our relationships with each other look like outside of these walls. The church of God is so completely unique as an assembly of people joined together from all different kinds of backgrounds. Wealthy, poor, young, old, high class, low class, Michigan fans, Michigan State fans, whatever social distinction you can come up with, the church of God encompasses them all. And all are valuable members of the church because we are all united in Jesus. Therefore, we must seek unity despite our backgrounds. And finally, we must seek unity despite our geography. And that's our third point this evening. And we see this clearly in the description of the church that Paul gave in verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and their and ours, together with those in every place. The Corinthian church is not an island. They're not on their own, but they are joined with Christians everywhere, in every place, who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by this statement, we see that we must seek unity with those outside of our individual churches, that we must seek unity despite our geography, despite the distance that may be between our churches. And in fact, distance may have been involved even within the Corinthian church. More than likely, there was more than one church in the city of Corinth. In the days of the apostles, there wasn't one big central church building in the middle of town. There was no first CRC in downtown Corinth. Right? Instead, churches met in people's homes. And so there probably would have been several churches scattered throughout the city. And Paul, by referring to the church, singular, instead of churches, plural, is emphasizing the the importance of unity within the church. There are not many churches. No, there is one church of God as a whole. And that's why later on in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 12, Paul will talk about how there are many members, but one body. There are many people within the church, but there's only one church. And we all have our different roles, but there is only one body. Again, in that chapter, chapter 12, Paul stresses the unity of the Christian church. And we see this truth of the unity of the Christian church despite our geography in the third paragraph of Article 27. It says this, Furthermore, this holy church is not confined, bound, or limited to a certain place or to certain persons, but is spread and dispersed over the whole world and yet is joined and united with heart and will by the power of faith in one and the same Spirit. The church is not bound to a certain place, but it's spread all over the world. And as we've already noted, the church in the Old Testament was much smaller, right? It was confined to one physical location, to the nation of Israel. 
And in Matthew 28, Jesus told his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And from there, the church expanded rapidly to Judea and Samaria, to places like Corinth, around the Mediterranean, and eventually to the entire world, even to faraway places like Borculo, Michigan. You see, despite our geography, the church is united. Though the church finds itself in all kinds of different places and in different nations, it is united under the banner of Jesus. And our allegiance is to Jesus. And we see this in the fact that Paul refers to Jesus as Lord three times. And he calls Jesus Christ four times in these three verses. So often we get used to to our Christian terminology, and we use it without really giving it a second thought. However, these titles of Jesus are extremely important for understanding our unity as the church. First of all, by calling Jesus Lord, Paul is underscoring the fact that Jesus is the head of the church. He's the one in charge. Lord acknowledges that Jesus is the master, and we are his servants. Paul said, to everyone one Lord, their Lord and our Lord. There is one Lord. And secondly, by attributing the title of Christ to Jesus, Paul is demonstrating that Jesus is the true Messiah. He is the one foretold in the Old Testament who would be the true king of Israel. And with both of these titles, Paul is showing Jesus as the world's king, the eternal king, as we read in the second paragraph of Article 27, the one to whom all followers must pledge allegiance. He's the one who has our true loyalty. Now we do have other loyalties, don't we? The church of God lives all over this world and it's found in many different countries. And we all have loyalties to our home country. The Corinthians, being part of the Roman Empire, were loyal to Caesar. We pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. There are proud Canadians, there are proud Hungarians, there are proud Kyrgyzstanis. And these loyalties aren't necessarily a bad thing. But they are superseded by our loyalty to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our King. Now we can sing along with Lee Greenwood that we're proud to be an American, but our true nationality is that of Christian. Philippians 3.20 tells us that we are citizens of heaven. We are citizens of the church of God first and citizens of America second. Our leader to whom we look is not Caesar, it's not Donald Trump, but it's Jesus Christ. And therefore we see that because the church of God is united in Christ, not by national borders or ethnic groups or population demographics, that we must seek unity with each other. Nigerian Christians and Chinese Christians Latvian Christians and Peruvian Christians and Christians from every nation on the face of this earth, we can call them all our brothers and sisters in Christ, even though they live in a different place than us, and even though they might look a little differently than us. Thus, the unity that we have as the church of God opposes any racism or xenophobia, thinking poorly about other groups of people. Now, there's been a lot of political talk recently about racism, and we, can, and we can debate of how present it actually is in our country, but the one thing that we cannot debate is that it should have absolutely no place in the church of God. The church of God is not made up of one people group, but it consists of people from every tribe and tongue and, and nation on this earth. We still like our people groups, though, right? I grew up in a Dutch bubble in northern Michigan, My wife is from a Dutch bubble in south-central Iowa. And those areas are very similar to this Dutch bubble you have in Borculo and in West Michigan. We can get very comfortable in the communities that we're in where everyone looks a similar way, where everyone thinks a similar way and acts in a similar way, and we can think less of those outside of our bubble. If you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. I'm sure you've heard that. But the Church of Christ united together in Christ is more than our Dutch bubble. It's more than the CRC that we're a part of. The church of God is found throughout the whole world, and it consists of people of different languages and skin colors, all following Jesus Christ. And though we may look differently and speak differently, we may say that we are more closely united with the members of the church of God 
than to the people of our country in which we reside or the, bu- or the Dutch bubble that we've grown up in. The church of God is united despite our geography, united together in Jesus Christ, our King. And it's to his church, to those who are united despite their sinfulness, despite their backgrounds, and despite their geography, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ, their Lord. It's to this church, the church of God, that these words are spoken in verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The church of God receives the grace and peace of God. We receive it first through our reconciliation to God through Jesus Christ. We were enemies of God because of our sin, and we receive God's grace and peace through Jesus' death on the cross on our behalf. But we also receive God's grace and peace by uniting with his church. Now there's much that threatens to tear us apart. Our sinfulness threatens to divide us. Our backgrounds threaten to divide us. Our geography threatens to divide us. And yet, in spite of all of those things and many other things that threaten to divide us, we must seek unity. The unity that is found in belonging to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Because that's who the church is. We are people who are justified in Christ sanctified in Christ, and will be glorified in Christ. With the Corinthian church, with Paul, and with Sosthenes, and with the church across the world and across time, we are all followers of Jesus Christ. We are citizens of heaven traveling homeward. And as we journey together in Christ, when we put aside our differences, and we work through these things that threaten to tear us apart, we can find that unity that we read about earlier in Psalm 133. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. That's the kind of unity we need to strive for in the church. That's the kind of unity that we can only find in the church. Because despite our sinfulness, despite our backgrounds, despite our geography, there is one thing that holds us together, and that's Jesus Christ. The church of God is united in Jesus Christ, and because of that, We must seek unity with those in our congregation and with all those who bear the name Christian. May God enable us to do so for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your church. We thank you for the unity that we have, that we are united in Christ Jesus, our Savior. He has saved us all and has brought us all together in this community. And now, Lord, we pray that you would increase our unity with each other. Where there are grudges and tensions, where there is superiority, where there is a looking down on others who are different than us, we pray that you would remove such things from our hearts and replace them with the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.